Good morning, brothers and sisters. This is The Other Paul, and we are finally here with a very long-awaited and exciting interview with the Dr. James White. James, how are you going this fine Australian morning? How uh, how do you know this is going to be exciting? We haven't really gotten into it yet. and uh, I just know. Most people who know me would not really use that terminology um, or descriptor of uh, of exciting, but uh, hopefully everyone in Australia is excited that I am wearing a genuine, not made in China, um, Kuji sweater. And um, I, I have an entire collection of them. I have single-handedly attempted to keep the Australian uh, uh, economy uh, afloat uh, by putting <laughs> together this uh, collection of Kuji sweaters. So um, though I must confess, uh, there's a Canadian company that makes Kuji sweaters, basically. They're called Tundra, and they're really nice. So you got some competition. But again, Kuji gave up and shipped everything to China anyways, so whatever. But I actually, I'm actually wearing this so I can understand you, uh, because <laughs> you said that no live translation would be provided. So I figured if I'm wearing a Kuji, I'll understand it a little bit better. But there you go. By all means, thank you very much for your consideration. And thank you for keeping the Australian economy uh, afloat, as you say yourself. Now, today, ladies and gentlemen, today's topic for the stream is going to be on the beauty of elections. So normally, these kinds of streams, videos on this issue will be all about the exegesis. And that's cool. And maybe we'll, we'll even get into that if the natural, if the conversation naturally shifts that way. But this one is a little bit different. I wanted this to be more so addressing the emotional hurdles that people face with the doctrine of election as per the monogistic theologies, whether of full-on Calvinism or even Lutherans and other, um, and other sorts who affirm such a thing. Uh, and so we're going to be, we're, I'm going to be discussing and asking Dr. White questions on how to overcome those emotional hurdles, especially because he actually has a unique, interesting history uh, with being, for example, a hospital chaplain, and uh, he can he can describe that as he so pleases. Um, and just before we begin, as well, we've got a super chat here. Got to highlight that super hype. God bless you, Paul and James. Thank you very much. AMFM Melbourne represent right there. Um, and I must also give a nice and brief thanks to my uh, subscribe star supporters, as I usually do. You guys make all this possible. Uh, helping me turn this into a job with an income. Thank you so much. If you want to support uh, my work and, uh, uh, well, help me expand it and get some nice benefits for yourself, go to subscribe star down in the link below. It is very much worth it. Now, don't want to have to dilly-dally on that too much because I normally give all sorts of platitudes to my supporters, but I really want to get right into this because, Dr. White, I'm not most people and I do find this exciting. So we're going to jump right into this one. Um so I reckon uh, what we what we commence with really is, as I, as I mentioned, your your work as a hospital chaplain. Could you uh, briefly describe that for us? Well, uh, it was forced on me. Uh, we uh, on one we call it Black Monday. Many 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 years ago, we lost uh, about sixty percent of our our support in one day, and we weren't wow. we didn't have much support to begin with. So. I had uh, two kids um, and a wife to support, and it just so happened I was meeting with some more missionary, uh, more missionaries at a Christian guy's house, and he said, "You know, I'm I'm leaving uh, work at this particular hospital as a chaplain. I'm, I'm moving, and they're looking for somebody. You ought to, you ought to apply." And you know, I had my master's degree from Fuller, so I had never done anything like that made application, somehow got the job and was thrown somewhat to the lions in the sense that the very first night that I was on duty, uh, the code bell went off. There was a death in the hospital. The husband had just left the room, gone down to the cafeteria to get something to eat, comes back and I'm intercepting him and taking him into literally, there was no waiting area in that, that particular part of the hospital. It was a it was a closet. It's a storage closet. Right. And she did not survive. And here was an elderly man with no hope, um, no preparation for death, no, no idea. And that was my first night. It was not a Christian hospital, by the way. It was a major 
you know, they've all changed names since then, but it was a major uh, chain. And on Sundays, Sunday afternoons, I was only supposed to do it every other week, but for the first six months, I did it almost every Sunday, was a lost support group. And I that's where I learned and suffered a great deal. Um, Christians don't talk about those things. They, I, I discovered Christians really don't talk about death any more than the world does. And hence, we're not prepared for it. We, did, we don't understand. You know, if you're old enough to, to love something, you're old enough to grieve its loss. And so there is a lengthy process of grieving. And I learned a lot about it during my years as a, as a chaplain there. In fact, I only left primarily because the secular uh, organization that owned the hospital was going to force me to start dealing with a Wiccan chaplain, um, a, a witch. And um, I just couldn't, couldn't pull that off. And so um, I have lots of stories from those years. I won't go into them right now. But the point is mm. that when I was reading and then studying at the beginning of that chaplaincy, I, I discovered that most Christian books on the subject, to be perfectly honest with you, stunk. Hmm. And what, what you'll really find to be helpful in dealing with the subject of death are the Puritans. Um, the, the, you know, people writing before this past century, shall we say, because everybody experienced death. You lived in the same house as people who would die. We hide, we hide from death now. And so as a result, we've hidden God from death. And I picked up a bunch of books and I read these books and I said, I can't do this. This is, this is completely contradictory to what I believe the Bible teaches about God's sovereignty and God's purposes. And it was always trying to put God over here and the death is over here. And and I was, they were basically saying, you should, you should say to people that, that God will help you to put things back together again, but God didn't have anything to do with what broke stuff apart in the first place. And it's mm. like, that doesn't make any sense. And mm. it's, it's not biblical in the first place. And so it was, um, it was a tremendous challenge because the vast majority of the people that I dealt with in the subject of death were not believers. And they did not have hope. But I should mention, I will never forget, and I guess it's a testimony to him and his death. There was a, a, an elderly man, very elderly man, that I never got to speak to. The nurses told me about him. He was in the CCU, the intensive care unit, critical care unit. And the nurses told me about him. And they, they said, he is just so amazing. You, you come in, you have to do a blood draw. You know it hurts, but he'd always say, thank you, honey. And he was just, just had an amazing disposition. And so this one nurse told me, she said, uh, she said, I, I was doing something with him. And I said, uh, you, you know, you're dying. And he says, oh, I, I know, honey. And she says, are you afraid? And he looked at her and he said, honey, I've talked with God for over 80 years of my life. Why should I be afraid to go see him? And he was a Christian man. And it just so happened that I was on duty. I went in and I saw that there was a relative in his room. And I went in to talk with her. And after I, I was a biology major in college, Bible, biology and Greek uh, were two majors and a minor. And so I learned pretty early on to recognize the signs of death when someone was dying by the monitors and things like that. And while I'm talking to her, I'm sort of looking over sideways at the monitors and I, I go to her, I think it's time. And about then the bell started going off and that same nurse that had talked to me before comes in and the relative stood on one side of the desk, the, 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 the bed, the, the nurse on the other, I was standing next to the relative as he very, very peacefully entered into eternity. Now, in comparison to some of the soul-shattering deaths that, that I saw, 
in the hospital. That was a, that was a testimony to that nurse, to all those nurses, to myself, of what it means to die well and to have a, a living faith in a sovereign God. And uh, I'll, never, I'll never forget that. And there's many, many stories like that, not just in the hospital, but um, we certainly at my age, I'm thinking much more about finishing well. And there was, there was a man who finished well. That's pretty amazing. That's definitely an amazing story. And it really well slips into really what I wanted to ask next. And I think you kind of gave a hint of it already on how, how did your reformed uh, monogistic worldview uh, guide how you interacted, how you, how you dealt with your, with your patients? Yeah, it, um, it did keep me from saying some of the things they wanted me to say. People want you to affirm what, what they hope is true, not necessarily what is true. They don't want, you don't necessarily want you to tell them what the truth is. They want you to give comfort that isn't really comfort. And, that, and that's, that's one mm. of the problems. And I think that would even be worse today because that was, that was in the nineties. And for me, that wasn't very long ago, but for some of you, that's ancient history. And there has been a lot of change in culturally uh, since then. Mm. But like I said, um, I have to approach the subject of death and suffering as it is a part of God's world and as it is under God's decree. That doesn't change the reality of people's responsibilities for their actions and things like that, but it removes simple chance and actually insists on there being purpose and meaning. And that really is a major dividing line in how Christians deal with suffering, death, evil. And unfortunately, most people don't think about it. The, the synergistic worldview, the synergistic doctrine of salvation, I should say, it's not really a worldview, but it's, it's a part of it. When you boil it all down, when you press, and, and, and most of the people that hold this go to churches where they're never pressed to actually think these things through. That's one of the, the big things, is if you don't have preaching of the whole counsel of God, the, the ministers can literally choose to keep their people from ever having to face these things until death strikes in their family, and then mm. it's too late. And then you have to sort of patch stuff together. But if you are in a church that never forces you to think these things through, then you don't maybe realize that what you're saying in a synergistic context is that God either didn't know that all this evil and suffering would exist. So you've got your open theists out there that do their thing. Or... Um, God knew, but had no purpose in it because there wasn't anything he could do about it because of some concept of human autonomy or mm. whatever else. Mm. And when you push people, very frequently, they don't want to hear that. Mm. And, and they will respond very, very emotionally to that. But you either need to do that in a loving fashion in communication with people or they're going to get hit with it in that teeny tiny waiting room in the ER. And that's not when you need to be thinking these things through uh, because you're going to do so based on emotion, not based upon, um, upon scripture, upon a, a meaningful worldview, something you can pass on to your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. And one thing I certainly learned is you have to be very, very careful when someone has just had a loss or is dealing with grief because they will make decisions in that mindset that they will stick with for the rest of their lives, even mm. when faced with overwhelming evidence that the position they've taken is foolish and destructive. Mm. I, I saw it happen. Um, yeah. Humans are, are weird little creatures. <laughs> we really are. 
and we can sometimes do some very very strange and odd things mm -hmm. yep especially if you're if you're from australia 100 percent, i agree with that <laughs> <laughs> i just thought that and, was due to, i thought that was due to fosters but anyways whatever <laughs> whatever oh especially if you're a lebanese mix like me now that's just next level um but that that really does that that, that really is helpful and makes a lot of sense um yeah, because like I, I can't remember the last time. Maybe, maybe there's one. Maybe there's one, but I cannot remember the last time any church I've been at preached on death, and it's inevitable. Actually, no, no, no. I take that back. I take that back. Um, at my own, uh, at my own church. I, I, I won't name it. I won't, don't want to dox myself. Um, but I've only gone there. My new Anglican church. I only started there recently. And the first sermon series I got, uh, I saw when we got there was on Ecclesiastes. And so it passed through this topic pretty well and it was an absolutely brilliant series but really apart from that it's very seldom 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 discussed and sure enough this is the first reformed church like that i've ever properly been to um and so and, and so that really that really 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 does make a lot of sense when you raise that as it is but then you'll often get the um you'll often get the retort that i've seen so many times from uh generically speaking anti-monogists whether they're uh, some form of Armenian or Molinist or provisionist, what have you. And they'll always, they'll always bring up the good old canard of how, um, or how, what do you, what do you reform people tell someone who've experienced a loss? Do you just tell them that it's all God's plan or whatever, as if that's like a really bad thing? Like how, how would you, how would you get back at that? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I happen to know that our Molinist friends are seething right now at the, uh, <laughs> at the dismissive terminology you used and you're simply throwing them in together with the Armenians. They're just like, yeah, we are gladly. so far <laughs> above that. Um, <laughs> I can say that I, last year, I, I earned all, all my, my bona fides in dealing with, uh, with Molinism anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so, and I don't want everyone to do it again. So uh, please Lord, not, no more of that. Someone else take that, that issue on. Well, when when someone let, let let's distinguish being in the hospital situation with unbelievers mm -hmm. and in a pastoral situation dealing with believers mm -hmm. so obviously most of the time being a pastor myself now i'm i'm currently in in a church as most people know that is very very young uh i'm one of the old codgers uh, at apologia church and and most everybody there is significantly younger than i am and so we but we have had deaths we had a woman who died I'll, I'll be straight up front she she got covid but it was the way that it was treated that caused her death mm. and she was a mother and children and so yeah i've done funerals and things like that recently within that particular context and so obviously you're gonna you're gonna approach this subject differently in talking with a fellow believer. I, I, I never attempted to pull out my Bible and uh, walk somebody through Ephesians chapter one, who is an unbeliever at the hospital. Mm. They, have, they have no grounds for even yeah. knowing where in the world I'm going. A fee? Uh, what, a fee? Be, what you know, I did present the gospel to people, but that's a different context. Mm. When you're dealing with believers, um, you do have to find out where they're coming from. And if there is a strong commitment to the sufficiency and the authority of scripture, then you have the foundation to move forward from that point. And uh, let, let's think about it just on a practical pastoral level here. Um, one of the key texts that I have preached at many funerals has been when Paul writes the Corinthians and he, and he says, you know, may God uh, comfort you, um, provide you with divine comfort so that you then, having been comforted by God, can comfort others. And so there is a, there is a purpose in our suffering that we, being comforted by God, learn how then to be the channel through which God can bring his comfort to others. Mm. Now that means there is a purpose 
in our suffering, there is a purpose in our loss. And you either have to have the idea that that purpose is God doing his best to go, oh, no, I didn't expect that person to die. Let me see if I can come up with some way of making this. No, <laughs> that, that's obviously not the God of Scripture. The, hmm. the, the one who says, I've, my, my days were written in, in your book. Uh, I mean, this is this is how the saints understood Sorry, James, that, that was just middle knowledge, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is how the saints understood um, their own suffering, their, their mm. own uh, diminishment of bodily capacity over time. I mean, uh, I'm experiencing that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just days away from entering into my seventh decade, which means I'm turning 60. Congrats. And uh, as an athlete, you know, things just don't work the way they used to work. And uh, I, I I went to my 40th uh, high school reunion recently. Mm. And ev at every reunion, there's been this board with the pictures of my classmates that are no longer alive. Mm. And that board gets bigger and bigger every time. So no matter how you try, you have all these reminders from God of the fact that you're you're moving toward the end of your life. You're not going to live mm. forever in this earth, in this state. And when you look at scripture, the saints that are experiencing this, they're not thrashing about. They're not going, why God? Why God? They, they know this is God's intent, his purpose, his decree, his world. Mm. And that he has fixed hmm. what their life is going to be and what it's going to involve and how long it's going to be and everything else that you, you just don't have any other perspective than that. Hmm. Read the, read the Psalmist, hmm. read Job, read hmm. Isaiah, whatever, wherever it is, you're going to find the same thing. And so I have to trust that even if I'm talking with a believer uh, years ago, before we started, I was mentioning to you um, hmm. an, an IRC chat channel. And hmm. um, that that's how I've known people literally from around the world, even folks down there in, in, uh, in Australia. Um, we had a woman come into our channel uh, one night. I remember when it happened. Um, and she had the background in the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ is not a reformed denomination. Hmm. If, if you're you have the Church of Christ down there in Australia, right? Uh, th that, that, that's a Pentecostal denomination, is it? No, 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 no. Oh. No, this is the... Because um, I know all the Pentecostal one with that. Yeah, the, the Church of Christ here in the United States, um, extremely, uh, you know, baptismal regeneration, no instrumental music. Oh. Um, you know, uh, but, but very, very focused mm. upon... They'll do three-night mm. debates on Acts 2.39. Seriously. Mm. You know, three hours a night, uh, just on one verse. So they're an interesting group. Wow. She had that as her background so very 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 non-reformed of uh type of a of a perspective but but she had a strong commitment that if the bible teaches it i need to believe it and so i remember the first night just walking her through john six just let's just boom, 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 boom. i've done that with a lot of people over the years and she didn't know what to do with it so she comes back a few days later and she's talked to her Church of Christ elders and she says, well, they said this. And so we walked through their answers and took her back to scripture. Da, 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 da. This lasted for a couple months. Hmm. She kept coming back and she has worked for years now as the secretary to a well-known reformed writer in the Midwest Wow! because she, she said, look, it's it's right there. It's it, that's what it says. <clears throat> and we didn't just stay in John six, though we made sure to nail that one down. Mm. We went through a number of of texts, and eventually she's like, it it cost her family, it cost her friends, mm. but she had that commitment. And if that commitment is there, then there is so much in Scripture that we can take people to the promises of God where God honestly deals with the reality of evil and suffering and says, 
I'm God. I'm big enough to be trusted in these situations. Even if you can't know mm. what the purpose is right now, mm. I can be trusted in these situations. And so yeah. uh, that's where I go is, is to those texts. Now, have I been wrong about some people? I assumed that they had that kind of commitment to uh, believe what God's word says and then found out that wasn't really the case. And, and so there wasn't the nice, happy conclusion to the conversation. Sure. Um, mm. You know, there's nothing I can, I can do about that. I, I can only point people to the answers. Uh, I can't open the heart and mind to, to accept those things because Really, honestly, uh, you know what you you know what this is. There, there is a kind of th- th- there's an experience, and I'm not talking about just experientialism, but there's an experience in the Christian life where you really all of a sudden realize that God is God and I am not. And I think it's an Isaiah six, God on His throne holy, holy, holy type of an experience where your rebellious little heart is finally completely shattered Hmm. and you recognize who God really is and you stop putting him in the box and you stop saying, I'm only going to believe you so far. Instead, you go, I'm going to believe everything your word says about you. Including, and it's interesting for Jonathan Edwards, for Edwards, one of the greatest evidences of conversion, of regeneration, was when a person longed to believe everything that is true about God, even the things that are the most offensive about God. Hmm. And I think he, I think he was onto something there. Yeah. I, I really do think he was onto something there. Yeah, that's that's really the only that's really the only possible way, because if you if you don't go that way, if you're not willing to follow where it's clear, this is what God does, what he says, then you may as well give up the whole enterprise, stop pretending to even be a Christian. You can't you you can't go partial. It's it's really it really is a zero sum game in that respect. So basically how to get back at a at that kind of a quip is just to say, look, this is a bullet we have to bite. There is a there is a divine plan with everything, and it's actually it's actually a great comfort in many respects. Oh, it is. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's an incredible comfort. And even even I, when I like, I was originally like, not I wasn't like a rabid oh, Calvinism evil, but I was just not. I was like I, 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 I was a generic person who would call himself Arminian, but not actually know what classical Arminian theology was. Um, but I but I was generally opposed to, to to any kind of monogistic theology, which I just always call Calvinism because Calvinism is a big bad word. Even though Lutherans, Augustinians, Thomists, and all I believe the same thing on this issue. But let's ignore that. <laughs> but but um but eventually, when I did come to it, even though it was like I didn't want to, but I saw it was clear. And really, your work was a big part of that. I actually ended up saying, "Huh, this is actually really nice, and it's actually quite beautiful." Because I know even in the worst point in in my life i know that there's there's really a plan behind it that's ultimately gonna that's ultimately gonna work out amazing for me and others yeah it, it, it's not just a plan i mean it is it is a purpose mm. to con to to conform you to christ i was um mm. uh i have the world's greatest chiropractor thankfully she's just wonderful i would not be able to do anything like what i've been able to do if, if it weren't <laughs> for her her um her husband has developed really debilitating difficult um, seizures and he can't drive any longer and things like that. He had a horrible car accident when he had a seizure. And, and, um, she was telling me that, you know, after one of these seizures, uh, he, he was saying to her, he was saying, you know, and this was, this would be something we all would ask within our hearts. Why me? You know, he wants Mm. to do all these things. He wants to, to, to do more in ministry and things like that, but he's limited by, how much stress he can handle before it's going to cause these seizures. Hmm. And she said to him, and this is what she reported to me. She, you know, when he said, why me? She said, because without this, you would never be able to be as much like Jesus as you will be able to be with this. Hmm. I've heard that said in a lot of different ways but maybe not quite that bluntly 
plainly and clearly. But if you really do believe what scripture says, that God has a purpose in making each one of us like Christ, conforming mm -hmm. us to his image, that means that there is a purpose and there is an intention, and it's the most beautiful purpose and intention that could ever be. Uh, it's not just some cold, generic plan that I'm working my purpose and I'm just going to crush you in the ground in the process. If you are one of Christ's sheep, then you have the greatest promise ever that whatever happens in your life is, is going to make you more like Christ and is going to glorify him. So I'm sure you've read or watched The Hiding Place, right? The hiding place. Um, that's the Cory Ten Boom one. Yes. Um, I don't think I've watched it, but I read the book uh with my class back in like all the way back in like sixth grade, I think. Oh, oh good. Okay. Yeah. That was a while a while ago. Um yeah. thankfully the one time I've been to the Netherlands, I got to visit the Ten Boom home. I got to visit the hiding place, see the see the whole nine yards. It was um really a spectacular experience. And you know, watch the film, read the book again when I was in high school and read it again later on as an adult. When I think about what they went through in Ravensbrück, and I and I I'm often as I think about some of the worst scenarios for our future right now. OK, um, the, 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 the greatest scenario is Christ will crush all of his enemies. But there are a lot of dark times in church history. And if we're going into a really dark time, I think about this a lot. I think about the story where they were transferred in Ravensbrück, which was the woman's concentration camp there in uh, the German concentration camp, to a uh, dormitory, to a building that was infested with fleas. I mean, these were bad places. Um, I've only got, I only got to visit one um, Sachsenhausen, just outside of, of, of Berlin, Hitler's private little uh, concentration camp. So I want I've toured, but um, they were just, it was just a horrible, horrible place. And uh, Corey and her sister, Betsy, they enter into this place and Corey's just, she's, she's nearing her breaking point. She really is. And the fleas are just, just driving her insane. And Corey, who, as you know, died there in Robinsbrook. Uh, uh, Betsy, I'm sorry, switch to. Um, Betsy says to Corey, we need to give thanks in all things in Christ Jesus. And Corey's like, I can't. I, hmm. I've tried. I've done this. We've gone through so much. We have, we have seen so much. I can't do this. And Betsy's like, but that's what scripture commands us to do. And so Betsy bows and gives thanks for their new place where they're staying in this horrific context. And it's only a few days later, because remember, they had that Bible that God just basically made invisible to the guards. <laughs> they, they had it the whole time. They started a Bible study. They would start a Bible study wherever they were. And, and the women would flock to it because it was the only hope they could find. And they were always talking about dealing with hatred in the heart and, and what love means and things like that. And they all of a sudden realized something one day. They were able to have the Bible studies without interruption. You know why? Because the guards wouldn't come into that place because of the fleas. Mm. So they had total freedom to openly That's proclaim right. the truth and do Bible studies and everything because of the fleas that Betsy had given thanks for and that Corey <laughs> simply couldn't. And I, I look at that and I go, there's the sovereignty of God. There's, there's the decree of God hmm. working out in time. That was his purpose. That was his intention. And that's why we can actually give thanks in all things, even when we cannot see. And in fact, in every human way, mm. 
we're ready to just throw in the towel. I, I can't, God, I, I can't do this. This is, it's, it's too much for me. And yet God sustains us mm -hmm. in the midst of it. And he has, we can have the absolute confidence of God's purpose in all of it. That's, that's so true. It really is brilliant. There's so many moments like that you can find of just total pure providence. And even, even I have, have been keeping an eye out a lot in my own life of just those just little things that providentially work out, even in the middle of like a really crappy situation. I'm always just thinking, wow, thank you, God, for that. Thank you. Thank you for all that. And it all comes together in like a beautiful, beautiful harmony when you have that framework of this was all decreed from from before from before all creation. This was actually all intentional. There's all entire purpose to it. It wasn't just the post hoc putting together of things like, oh crap, what's this mess I have here? And oh, 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 there we go. We've got something nice here. It's there's actually meaning and intention to it. It's actually, it's actually kind of beautiful. Um, and really, I think I think largely a lot of this stuff really is covered. Uh, a good deal, the kind of more following, more general questions on this, I had, I, I guess that I had prepped, but um, really we can, we can get, um, we can kind of focus it down a little bit more to it, into it. And so in light of all this stuff, which is clearly, clearly there's, there's a clear harmony and beauty with election and, and it's amazing power to explain why they're suffering. Look, there's, there's a purpose into all and really to give an ultimate hope behind it. Um, but nonetheless, and I think you've kind of given hints here or there in, in what you've said so far on it. Um, why do you think non-monogists, um, not perhaps not all of them, perhaps there's some who are just genuinely, look, I'm not exegetically, exegetically convinced, but I know for a fact that many will have, that for many of them, there is a root um, emotional issue and that's not to denigrate it. It's a real thing. You've got to deal with the heart. You've got to be able to emotionally reconcile things. Um, and so why do you think many non-monogists have, this kind of emotional impediment to the doctrine of election. So both whether with respect to suffering, as we've been talking about so far, but then of course, uh, also as well, moving on to the soteriological issue where God elects some to glory and others to destruction. Why do you think there's an em emotional impediment behind that? Well, for the majority of the people that, that I've dealt with, it had to do with uh, maybe their introduction to the faith, the, hmm the the pastor or individual that was involved in uh, introducing them to the gospel or something like that warned them about it or um, <laughs> presented the gospel in such a, a fashion that they would feel like in essence they were uh, rejecting that person that means so much to them or that church that meant so much to them that first place mm. um, I think there's a lot of that that is involved. Um, I think of one good friend of mine who, um, honestly, his, his rejection of it is directly related to experiences in his life where he would have to, those experiences defined who he is and he would have to question their validity mm. if he were to adopt a reformed understanding of the sovereignty of God. And that therefore takes away the foundation for seeing election because we're sort of using the term election very, very, very broadly here mm. um, because there's a very specific meaning of the term in the new Testament a specific usage of the term, like mm. in Ephesians one or Romans eight and nine and, yeah. and, and places like that. Yeah, there's election and there's a divine decree. There's, there's exactly decree. right. Yeah. And the one's the foundation of the other. You can't, yeah. you can't have a specific decree of election that is, that is personal. Uh, that mm. means that when the elect are united with Christ in his death, burial and resurrection, that it's a personal thing that, you know, as the mm. song says, my name was written on his hand. Uh, mm. he, he thought about me. Uh, when you have a non-personal form of election where you have class election, mm, yeah. where God simply chooses to save whoever decides to be saved. So God <laughs> chooses to save a class of people and it's up to us to get into that group. Mm. That becomes impersonal it, it, because the choice is of a class of people, not individuals themselves that make up that, that group. When you, when you have that, that, still allows for the role of mankind. I really mm. think when you when you boil it down, 
there is the the concern about quote unquote fairness. Uh, you you've heard so many people. I can't believe that because that attacks the character of God because God's mm. being unfair. Yeah, and it's like and to be fair, yeah. he must allow people to be free. Uh, exactly, and and so, uh, and and we've done it a thousand times before. You you push into it and you go, okay, let's let's see if you're being consistent here, um, because honestly, that will necessarily force you into consideration of uh, post mortem evangelization, possibilities of universalism, all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff along those lines. And historically, that's what's happened in a lot of Arminian denominations is you've ended up movements toward universalism and, and other degradations along those lines. Um, but there's this, this, this concern about, well, I can't see how that would be loving because obviously the love of God is different than creaturely love. I mean, it brought about the self-giving of the second person of the Trinity. So it's mm. clearly different, mm. um, but not different as in less uh, glorious or passionate, but even more so because it involves that self-giving. And I, I think a lot of it is just simply the fact that we are not challenged by our Bible reading and by our preaching to, to always keep in mind that we have a tendency to project creaturely categories onto God. Mm. And in so doing, we create contradictions and limitations um, that keep us from seeing some of the most uh, beautiful aspects of God's revelation in Scripture. And so we, we can do that. We, it, it's not quite as threatening to people when I talk with them about things like God's eternity and help them to understand that God's entire experience of time is different than ours. That's not quite as threatening to them, but once you understand God's eternity and God's uh, otherness in that area, then you can start moving toward how that applies to how he deals with mankind as well. And there are, there are tremendous texts um, to be able to do this, but again, you can't you can't force it onto someone. Mm -hmm. um, I I have seen the Spirit of God over periods of time break down tremendous resistance to His truth. But I also have friends who remain resistant to these things, and I, unlike some Reformed people, um, God has His purpose and His timing into when when he leads us to come to better understandings there's things i i need to learn and understand better as well and so i i try to stay far far away because i've seen them self-destruct in so many ways mm. from the calvinists who turn this into a situation where look i've explained it as clearly as it can be explained to this particular person and they still don't believe it. And so clearly they're not a Christian. They make it mm. that that level of, of look, they're, they're rejecting God's truth. Well, there's a sense, there's a sense in which they are. Mm. I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna go, well, yeah, I, I believe God's truth is included in the fact that he is the one. You know, if he, he works all things after the counsel of his will. And it really means he works all things after the counsel of his will. But it is the application of that truth that we're talking about here. And I, I cannot force that into someone's soul. Mm. I have seen God do it in some amazing, amazing ways. Um, but I'm simply called to testify of the truth mm. and to try to do so in such a way that I don't get in the way of it. I've failed that more than more than I'd like to know. But I also had the opportunity, and I'm not sure if this work was what you're referring to earlier. Did the Potter's Freedom have something to do with your 
coming to understand. I was, I had that in mind and I wanted to mention it, but I forgot the name. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, the work that, that responded to um, Norm Gleiser's, um Part of Freedom. Oh no, that, that is it. Sorry. That is no, that no, no, no. Potter's no, no, Freedom but, and his his book was called Chosen But Free. That's what I meant. Yeah, his book, Chosen But Free. I, I, I knew of that book and I wanted to mention it, but I forgot I forgot what it was called. But yeah, but yeah, that that's 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 a funny one there. <laughs> There's um I I know entire churches that were founded because of that book. <laughs> um you know, people on the missions field because of that book. Um I had a I had a seminary student and his wife come up to me a number of, uh, in 2011 and they had a a little child with them in a stroller that had a genetic disorder that means that he wasn't going to live much longer that there was mm-hmm. nothing that could be done and i remember him saying to me if we hadn't come to understand the sovereignty of god we would we'd lose our faith in this situation because here's our precious child mm-hmm. and and that child's not going to live very long at all. Hmm. And if we didn't realize that there was an absolute purpose in what we're suffering, then we would have no confidence in the love of God. Yeah. So when I first when I first saw uh, Chosen But Free, you know, Norm and I were were buddies back then, um, and I I had sent him my books because we had had some discussions while he was still writing it. And he wrote it for Bethany House Publishers, which was my publisher at the time. You know, King James Only Controversy, Roman Catholic Controversy, they all, all published by Letters from Roman Elder. They're all published by Bethany House. So the same editor that worked on his book worked on mine. <laughs> so uh, I had some of the backstory. And, you know, it, 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 it I had the feeling at the time, oh, this could cause so much confusion and you know, why? And I also am like, man, if I respond to this, it's going to cost me a lot. Mm. You know, um, (laughs) I'm not going to get invited to a lot of places that I've been invited to in the past. And that's true, by the way. Um, But now in hindsight, looking back, here was an event, the publishing of his book, that allowed me to write a book that to this day continues to have a tremendously positive impact for lots and lots of folks. And I see now in hindsight, the sovereignty of God all over all of that, mm. but I couldn't see it at the time. And it's just one of those many, 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 many things in the Christian life where we, we, we come to realize in the moment, mm. it can seem like God's mm. lost control of things, but even even our lives, short as they are, frequently provide enough perspective to be able to see, oh, okay, that wouldn't have happened. That person would have ended there. That wouldn't have happened. We see the beauty of that decree coming together. Mm-hmm. We can't see it necessarily at the time. And of course, there are even bigger issues that we can't see in our lifetimes. We'll only see from the perspective of eternity. Yeah. Uh, there's, no, there's no question about that. Um, mm-hmm. And we have to, we have, again, it's a matter of trusting that God's yeah. a whole lot bigger than we are and knows a whole lot more than we do. And uh, uh, that's, that's, just, that's just part of biblical teaching. Mm. Yeah. And to, and to give anyone, especially if you're, especially non monogists like to give them a heads up, we're not trying to psycho any, psychoanalyze anyone in particular. We're more or less, especially, um, especially uh, Dr. White here, giving observations on just what we see with non-monogists and, and more more fervent anti-monogists as to where as to how uh how their emotional struggles really originate so we're not necessarily saying any every anti-monogist or every non-monogist has this kind of issue but i nonetheless highly encourage people while you're listening if you're a non-monogist and especially if you're thinking that's not what i think and, and all that jazz that after this interview or whenever take a step back Ignore the fact that you don't like me or you don't like James White or whatever, and just think: is is, is what they're saying true? Do I actually have um, to, to summarize what you say a strong urge that I want to be in control as a human? I want to 
be able to know that I am the captain of my own ship, the master of my own fate and all that jazz. Um, and because I've, I've, I've tried to, and by God's grace, I have on occasions on numerous issues, been able to reflect on even what people I utterly despise say and think, hang on, is there actually truth to this? And can I apply this? Because if God can speak through the mouth of the donkey, he can speak through people that I really don't like. And so I encourage non-monogists who are listening right now to, to do the same thing with everything we're talking about. Do you have, have you considered that maybe you do have this, um, this, this issue, this, this really this emotional impediment that may be unduly affecting how you read the very words of God. That's, that's, that's what I would say with that. Um, and so I guess that is, that's how I guess I'd summarize what you say here that, um, James, that people do want to feel that they're in control, um, to a large degree. Well, there, there's, there's that. And, and I, I think there is some truth to the concern that people have about the character of God. I just mm. don't think that they're going to the right yeah. source to determine what the yeah. character of they're God kind is. They're kind of reasoning it a little bit backwards. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, the, the character of God needs to be determined by his own self-revelation. Mm. And there are, I've just met a number of people who are inveterately anti-reformed and they just simply will not accept what well a, a place where that illustrates this is when i find somebody who starts waffling on the historical reality of israel coming into canaan the destruction of the amorites um you know major examples of god bringing judgment upon people that's when i know i've got somebody here that has They've created a theology of God as friendly grandfather and everything they're going to run into that disturbs that they're just going to explain it away. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing to me how many people especially are extremely uncomfortable with the old Testament. And, and, you know, when I was in high school, I was disturbed by how many people would say, well, you know, you've got the God of the Old Testament, then you have the loving God of the New Testament. <laughs> I knew enough back then to realize. Hello, Markion? Uh, is that you? Hello. Uh, that's, that's a really bad direction to go. And yet it was so extremely popular in the mega Southern Baptist church that I was in as a, as a teenager that um, it was amazing. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent true. Um, and I guess now that we hopefully, hopefully accurately diagnose the issue, because I mean, I, I've, I've been around this for so much of my life. I, I was a non-Calvinist myself, someone who's critical of it. And I've been around those people and I've talked with them about it uh, for, for, so, for such a long time. So I have a pretty good gauge of the concerns that both exegetical and in, in this case, emotional. Um, and so now that we've somewhat diagnosed the issue there, what would you say that someone can do or how, how biblically, um, how in, in terms of biblical and emotional ways, whether um, in terms of how they should dispose themselves, but, but perhaps if you've got some practical steps, how can someone work to remove such um, controlling presuppositions that ultimately uh, at least can distort how they read Holy Scripture? How can people go about that? Well, that, that should be, a, an essential part of the ministry of preaching and teaching in the church, uh, mm. exposing people to the whole counsel of God. I, that's one of the reasons I do think it's important to have um, at least a, a solid mixture in the preaching and teaching to where there's at least some attempt to work through books so that you're dealing with everything rather than getting to pick and choose. Um, it, it's just, it's way, way, way too easy to avoid the offensive passages. I mean, uh, I, I ran, I ran into a guy. Where was I? Oh, I was a G3. I was a G3 conference, uh, in Washington a few, a few weeks ago, I believe it was. I think that's where it was. And I, this fellow came up to him and he, up to, up to me and he looked a little familiar, but he said, uh, you've you've talked about me a lot over the years on your programs and i'm like okay and he says i'm the guy that you talk to after 
you did a Bible study at a Southern Baptist church the, where I, we were both members on Romans 9. And I was the one talking to you going, you know, I had read Romans 9 before, and I remember thinking to myself, that sounds like election to me, but I know we don't believe that, so it can't be that. <laughs> and I had, just, <laughs> I had just walked through it, and he's like, so it is that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, it's it's right there. And, and so I don't that that would have had to have been, you know, 35 years ago. He walks up to me just this past year and says, yeah, I've heard you tell that story. And I'm the guy um, that was <laughs> that was me. And uh, and you you messed my life up back then, too. So it's like, oh, OK, fine. Um, so there is that that mindset that says, well, I yeah, I see it. But that can't be that. That, 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 that I'm, I'm just going to put that off to the side. So there's an example of somebody. Hmm. I introduced it to him, and he's like, "Yep, that's what the word says." And so over time, you 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 make your decisions based upon that. So just practical things. Honestly, you you can't understand the sovereign decree of God until you understand the glory of the holiness of God. So mm -hmm. I think one of the most practical things, um, I just gave a, a friend of mine who comes from a very different background than me, okay, and is working through a lot of stuff. Um, I just, I, one of the first books I gave him was The Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul. I just found out that Ligonier has actually put out uh, uh, pleasing God, the holiness of God, and chosen by God in one volume. So three volumes in one. So mm -hmm. I, I gave that to him just last week, the week before last, actually. Mm -hmm. When I read The Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul, it's literally one of the only books. In fact, I if you, if you ask me what other book have you ever read in one sitting, I couldn't think of one. Maybe some really super short ones, but once I started reading the holiness of God, I, I couldn't put it down. I went to one, two, mm -hmm. three o'clock in the morning, whatever it was that I, that I had to do to, to read it because I, I simply could not put it down. In fact, interestingly enough, there's a Mormon fellow that I've had a few dialogues with uh, that um, instead of sending him books on Mormonism, because he already knew all that stuff anyways, um, I thought, send him the holiness of God. Because I can't think of anything more different from the Mormon concept of God mm. than the holiness of God. I mean, so on the practical level, the holiness of God mean, means the differentness of God. He is totally other. And that's part of the discussion in Sproul is holiness is not just the moral ethical it's there but there is an otherness that is fundamental to what holy 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 means totally set apart unique and i think one of the real problems to coming to grips with god's right to decree and to work with his creation as he sees fit is that we see him as a big man we don't recognize that otherness aspect that mm. I think is foundational to, to understanding this. So I'm not saying there's a way to short circuit the spirit of God um, granting that grace of recognition of who I am and who God is. And, and yeah. you know, uh, Calvin starts off the institutes with where do we begin to, What's the relationship between our knowledge of ourselves and our knowledge of God? Can we have a true knowledge of ourselves without a knowledge of our creator? Can we have a true knowledge of the creator without a knowledge of ourselves? Uh, that wonderful conversation at the beginning of, of the Institutes. And um, you know, the conclusion he comes to is we need to start with God to truly know the creature. Okay. So if you come to know the otherness and the the 
the the fullness and completeness of God in and of himself. Mm. And and I think for a Christian, um, that's not that's not best found in man's philosophies or anything else. It's found in Isaiah 40 through 48. It's found yeah. in Jeremiah. It's it's found in in scriptural revelation. That's what I have always found to have the longest lasting impact upon the sheep of Christ is the voice of Christ in scripture. Um, but when I can come to understand the eternal blessedness of God and how he is totally other than I am. Now I have a, a basis for understanding how he does what he does and I can trust his self-revelation. And I'm not going to be constantly trying to limit what I think is possible for God to do based upon asserting and putting on him creaturely boundaries. That's where a lot of this comes from is there's a threat to someone's very human view of God. And there is, it will destroy that very human view of God. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's the whole point. It's, it's true. But you need to get rid of their misperception about God's nature before you can then give them the foundation for being willing to go. And this is then how God acts. You have to know who, who God is before you yeah. can then address the issue of how God acts. And uh, so on a practical level, something like the holiness of God that really gets to that and gives that exalted understanding of, of who he is, that seems to me to be, you know, the, the one of the best approaches. Yeah, I 100 percent, 100 percent agree with that. And it's a and it can be for some people. Like I thank God it was actually relatively, relatively easy for me and quick. I'm trying to just. Like let's just let's just read the scripture as it says. Let's just let the scripture talk as it, as it is, and it, and it just kind of clicked to me. Like, huh, that's what it says. Huh, okay. Uh, I guess I gotta. I guess I gotta. I gotta do what I gotta do. Yeah, but the, the, the spirit, the spirit's involved in that. That there. Yeah, absolutely. There, yeah, absolutely. There, there is there is clearly, um, you know, when when I was first introduced, well. Well, go on with your questions. I'm not. not, not I'm gonna go back with that story. Oh, no, it, was more, it, was, it, was, it was more. It was more. It was more. More a comment of elaboration. Like I was gonna say, for me, thank God, it was actually pretty easy. Um, but I guess for others, the spirit will allow for a great deal of a job trial. You know, where oh, yeah. they really, really struggle with the with the the, the the very concept that God Himself writes the story of our lives, so that in the ultimate sense we do not make our choices in the temporal sense that's absolutely true and unfortunately many non-monogists can't grasp the distinction um but ultimately it really is uh the story that god writes the analogy i like to use to explain this to people uh the, the, the distinction of how there is such a thing as a creaturely freedom and yet there is also a divine decree that says everything i like to give an analogy where i write like a i write like a short story that says this guy walks up to a fork in the road um, he deliberates and he considers which way he wants to go and then he chooses to go left. Now, in that story, he made a real rational choice, but how did that story come about? Did it just appear or did I write that story? So uh, I don't know what you think of that analogy, if you can, if you can, uh, whether you like it or you tear it apart or whatnot. <laughs> I, I personally think it's quite brilliant because I wrote the story and yet within the story, a guy is actually making a choice, if that makes sense. Yeah, I've I've heard similar similar attempts i'm not sure how far we can we can go with it um, oh, now he's right. i as a young man spent a lot of time trying to wrap my head around things and uh, i designed something called the eternity box uh, <laughs> that a friend helped me build that that did in a in a sense try to explain how you can have um a divine decree fixing issues in time and yet um, from another perspective, you see how that only comes to play in time and stuff like that. I've actually got it in the other room. Uh, I should, I should probably show that on the dividing line someday or something like that. Probably. Um, but, uh, at the same time, I, I always remember, um, that, uh, Edwards got himself in big trouble trying to figure out how the will of 
atom could exist in such a fashion to deal with the decree of God. And Calvin never got himself into that same mess because Calvin said, when God makes an end of speaking, so do I. Mm -hmm. And he lived by that. And Edwards, Edwards basically went past where the headlights of scripture shine. And once you get out there, there's, there's all sorts of stuff to get you in trouble with. Mm -hmm. And so there is a element of spirit born humility for us as creatures to go, you know, God can reveal exactly how much he wants to reveal for his purposes. And then beyond that, it's not ours to look into. And mm. I think a lot of, especially a lot of modern people struggle with that. They really do. Mm. Yeah. And I remember when you, when you say that I even, it brings echoes back to, to, to the writings of Irenaeus. Like I've been doing a lot of reading with him for some projects and he himself will say that, if there's a question of some important importance among the churches, we'll come together, we'll discuss it. But if we can't really find a clear conclusion to this issue, like it's just something that we just have to give up to God because we he hasn't revealed like every single thing to us. And so there, there really are issues where you can't just call together your Pope or your conclave or whatever and just say, hmm, this is the truth in this. No, no, no. There's 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 genuinely stuff that we just don't know. We just have to keep it up in Keep it up in God's hands. And uh, that's just, there's really no other no other way to go about that, really. Um, it'd be nice if we had a, it'd be nice if we had such an infallible Pope. It'd be nice if we had like a little robot that we just click a button and it'll just tell us the divine truth of every question we we give to it. Um, well. <laughs> Not sure how well. nice that would be personally. Uh, but <laughs> Just for the for those who struggle with not knowing issues, that'd be very nice to have something like that. But uh, that's not the real world. There's uh, we we have to deal with the cards that we've been dealt. Not God, we do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Let's not go. Let's not go there. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, now, really, really, a, a final a final key thing, um, and I guess it really wraps up and builds upon everything that's been said so far. I mean, really every, every question, every further question is built on what's come uh, before. That's how so well I organized this interview. Um, but how would you say ultimately that one can just not only appreciate a divine decree and election as something that is good and just on God's part, but then how, and, and just reckon and just reconcile it, like just neutrally, make it compatible with how one thinks and believes as they read scripture, but to really positively consider it as, wow, this is beautiful. How can you, how, how can someone take that next step from just, okay, fair enough. This is possible. And I guess I can affirm that all the way to, wow, this is actually amazing and beautiful. Thank Thank you, God. How, how do you think we can do that? Well, uh, in, in a couple of ways, I would say um, during that period of time when I was, self-consciously embracing reformed theology i had i had had it given to me in shots and dribbles that i didn't know about um in my upbringing my my dad was a graduate of moody bible institute and what was interesting is the um in fact yeah here it is um this is his christian theology book from moody Oh, wow. I had it rebound. They did a great job because it's the original cover, mm. but it's it's been really nicely rebound. And um, uh, what's fascinating is by P.B. Fitzwater, Christian Theology by P.B. Fitzwater. And this mm. was at Moody Bible Institute. P.B. Fitzwater was a Presbyterian. Mm. And so um, my dad absorbed elements of Reformed theology without necessarily the reinforcement of the terminology that would be commonly used to express that. And so I already had a pretty healthy, strong understanding of the sovereignty of God, but the, the, the technical terminology to sort of figure out everything else. And so in that time period where I was now reading Calvin and reading Sproul and I'm in seminary and and I'm reading, um, you know, start, I get introduced to Edwards. I can't even read that Banner of Truth version of Edwards anymore. It, the font is, I, I mean, <laughs> even with these, I just, I just, I just don't know that I could pull it off. It's so ridiculous <laughs> and small. 
Uh, that's that's just criminal. Anyway, uh, I am when I read Edwards' sermon on the sovereignty of God, I am crushed by it. I am blown away by it. I am uh, caused to worship. I am I am caused to see myself for what I really am. Uh, the, the creature of God completely dependent upon him for everything. Um, and so there is a, there is an acceptance of the beauty of that reality, even at that early time. So exposure to clear expositions of God's truth very often is the primary way that we, that we come to appreciate the beauty of these things. But then there is the fact that we, the, the Christian life is a constant reminder of the fact that we learn and forget, and we mm -hmm. learn and we forget. Every Christian who's been a Christian for as long as I've been a Christian anyways, uh, which is well over half a century now, um, I learn wonderful things. God works providentially in my life to sanctify me. And five years later, I'm relearning the same lesson again. Mm. The, the, the forgetfulness is not just a function of age. It is spiritual for, forgetfulness. And so I think you can, you can have those wonderful experiences back then, but you can't live on them. I, I can't live on the uh, truly spiritual experience of reading sections of Sharnock's existence and attributes of God and just being blown away by the awesomeness of God or A.W. Pink's gleanings in the Godhead. That was really important to me when I was a young person learning reform theology, basically. I can't live on those the rest of my life. I can think back to them and, and remember what they meant, but time dulls those um, sensations mm -hmm. and memories. Yeah. And so there is a there is a life experience sanctification means of coming to understand the beauty of God's power exemplified in his sovereignty and in his election. Um, you see it when I think of, I, I see it when I, I see at the Lord's Supper, my, my friends that I've known for years and years and years. And there they are remaining faithful, steadfast in the truth. Decades. Because I know many who didn't persevere. Mm. Uh, the older you get and the longer you're in the church, the more apostates you know. And so I could either focus on the apostates and become bitter and reject everything or by God's spirit, I recognize the function those apostates have as a warning and hence appreciate so fully the evidence of God's sovereign preservation of his people in those that I see at the Lord's Supper that have been coming down that aisle for decades and and longer um and have remained faithful and they'll tell you they remain faithful not because of anything in and of themselves but because of christ's work within them and so i think back to one of the elders at the small reform baptist church i was at for almost 30 years and he was dying he had a very he had always had a very weak heart and now he was he was on his deathbed. He died, I think, the next day after this conversation. But when I when I think of sitting there with him and his weak, feeble, but firm confession that his entire hope is to be found in the righteousness of another, the righteousness of his Savior. Mm. Um that kind of life lived in service to Christ. Once you, you see that and you, you see that in that person and this person and that person, 
that's when you really start seeing you're getting a tiny little glimpse of what you're going to see in fullness in eternity. Yeah. When we see the perfect justice and the wisdom of God worked out in the glorification of his grace. That's what Ephesians 1 says. And to the praise of his glorious grace. It's all going to come down to the praise of his glorious grace. And we we start to see you can't you can't have this when you're 20. Um, but you, you start getting up in years and you start to get a little glimpse and you start to see, yeah, it's been worthwhile trusting him all along. Mm. hundred percent, hundred percent. I like, I like that you mentioning seeing, seeing how, seeing the interconnected, the thing, interconnectedness of things in the world, everything that comes past good and bad. Whereas looking back at a, whatever you want to call Arminian provisionist, whatever kind of synergistic worldview where really events if many events truly are kind of isolated pockets from each other like you can talk about a basic sense of like material causality like a butterfly effect or what have you but really there isn't there really isn't a a divine transcendent level of connection like there really is in a well not we, we call it monogistic theology but let's just be straight up real biblical worldview especially if you go all the way back to the to the just the just the mindset of the ancient israelites and and really a lot of the ancient near east in general where they speak in such heavy deterministic terminology of like whether it be israel with yahweh he counted our days he set forth our entire path or any of the other cultures that talk about like oh the the gods have established our fate or or what have you so really it, it's really it, it's really rooted it's really funny it's it's actually kind of rooted in ancient thought and yet somehow it's just come about over time where we just kind of lose that idea and, and really and really have more so ironically than or or it is kind of ironic more so than many idolaters of old have elevated man to such a high position of of sovereignty and authority um yeah that's i don't i don't know really much else to say about that other than that's that's really the really really the best way to put it there's a connection there's a beautiful connection with everything in the world even even the good and the bad and um we have to be, and I guess we have to be content with like, hey, why did God allow this bad event to happen? Um, perhaps sometimes we can see, well, hey, look at that. It led to this good thing, led to that good thing, whatever. Sometimes we won't get that answer. And sometimes we'll just have to, that, that's going to be the ultimate exercise of can you actually trust God with things that you just do not know at all? And if that is a hang up for someone for accepting uh, a, mo a monogistic theology, then that actually says more about them in that they're not willing or able at least then to trust God with the truly unknown, I guess. What, what do you think of that? Well, yeah, it is a matter. There, there is, there's certainly a matter of trust. Um, and there is, a, I think a fear of fully recognizing that if it were not for God, um, you, you, your part just doesn't determine God's part. Um, there's a, I, I think people really fear, giving up that final little bit of control. They'll they'll say it's 99% of God, but they want to have that 1% that maintains control. And otherwise you have to trust God completely. Um it you know, let's not get into it right now cuz I'm running out of time, but um yeah, there's a um uh, you know, the big issue of parents and their children and trusting God in the salvation of your offspring. There's a lot of arguments amongst reform folks about stuff like mm. that. Um, yeah. But there is also an element of um, fear. You know, uh, one of the things I dealt with as a, as a hospital chaplain, you know, dealing with uh, the death of, of infants. My daughters had, had two stillbirths and um, that always, always comes up. And it seems to me that there is a fear of trusting God to do what's right in those situations. Mm. We want to, we want to put him in a box to make sure that he's doing the right thing in our opinion, even we don't have enough information to even, even begin to judge yeah. the, uh, the outcome of those things. So, yeah, I think there is a, an issue of just how far we're willing to trust God. And mm. if God's going to be sovereign, it has to be all the way. hundred percent, hundred percent true. Well, that was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I really thank you heaps, James, for, for, for everything you've explained so far. And I really do hope people both, whether you're monogist or not, 
Um, and especially if you're struggling with these kinds of issues as an emotional level, I really do hope this, this helped you guys a lot. And now we're going to transition right into the Q&A. So as usual, subscribe star supporters and Super Chats, they get priority. They could get to go first. And that's quite meaningful because we have a lot of questions. Um, so we're going to have to bolt through them. God willing, we can get to uh, as many as possible. And we're going to start with this one, this very interesting one from the other Philip, my good man, one of the Patriarch supporters. Can we see Dr. White debate a set of Acantis? The prompt could be, is set of Acantism a Protestant denomination? <laughs> Well, most of them that I know are really, really interesting individuals. Um, and oh, yeah. uh, especially these days now, I, I try to do debates that are going to have the, the broadest usefulness. Um, I did think that the the debate that uh, one of the Diamond Brothers did uh, a few months mm. ago was, was really, really interesting. That was amazing. Um, that got a lot of people talking. Um, but I... You know, right now I'm I'm really thinking in light of the elections that just took place in my own country um, mm. and the future as it seems to be unfolding. Uh, I've got some books I need to get written. I haven't written in a long time. Mm. And um, so I'm, I'm really focusing upon that and this little traveling that I'm doing around the United States. Um, it's it's an amazing contrast. 2019, 165,000 miles, including Melbourne. Uh, Johannesburg, Durban, Samara, Russia, two months in London. Um, I'm not a world traveler anymore. And, uh, but I am going to manage to get some de debates into that traveling. But I want it to be in areas that will at least complement some of the writing that I'm doing. I, I want to try to address some of the issues that I, I think will help people if we're going to be facing the difficulties I think we're going to be facing. And, mm. And I, I think we will be. Yeah, 100%, 100%. All right, next question. This one I'm posting in the live chat myself because it's from the uh, supporter questions feed on my Discord server. So I'm highlighting it. Oh, this guy, this guy. From the supporter, J. Athanasius, question, Dr. James White, what's your reaction to the Cameron Batuzzi conversion? Thanks and love your work at jw.org. <laughs> yes, very funny. Um, in answer, in answer to the serious part, I actually commented <laughs> briefly on the dividing line just a couple mm. minutes ago, literally, um, Coming about it. I, I called that one in May of 2020, um, mm. when I listened to him on with, uh, I guess he's one of your compatriots down there in Australia, uh, Roman Catholic fellow talking about John six and stuff like that. It was self-evident to me that here was an individual who was involved in Christian apologetics, but had no idea why he wasn't a Roman Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. So he had a completely uh, uh, missing foundations as far as epistemology, sola scriptura, mm -hmm. and certainly in the gospel as well. Oh yeah. And so I, I called that one, even though we had the conversation, I don't know, what was that about a year ago? Uh, he mm -hmm. and I, he was on the, on the dividing line. We, we did some talking, um, but I could, I could tell in 2020, uh, this was just simply a long drawn out conversion process. And so I'm not surprised by it at all. Uh, it doesn't in any way impact me because, you know, he's literally saying that the biggest thing for him was Eliakim. <laughs> and I'm just like, no. that, that, that is one of the, one of the Ugh. weakest, worst, historically, biblically, all along the line, uh, arguments yeah. I've, I've ever seen. And then I don't know if you saw it, but last night Trent Horn um, started responding to me on Twitter. I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. And you know, my response, as you saw, was this is not the time for you to be blowing your horn, Trent, because I'm sorry, you you've got a pope uh, that you know gives <laughs> gives the Eucharist to Nancy Pelosi. Francis, debate over. <laughs> and and then he's just a, he's just assigned two pro choicers to a to to a vatican council and you want to talk to me about the consistency of roman catholic oh. teaching sorry uh, this is not a good time for you all you all need to be yep. uh, getting stuff fixed in your own house before you start talking to anybody else so and, and, anyway. and that's that's without mentioning germany like literally the entire oh yeah, the oh, entire yeah. Country. <laughs> oh dear oh dear that is just funny all right now we can look at a couple of super chat questions 
Uh, thank you both for all of you. When will you join the true Western Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod? Side note, I would love for Dr. White to give confessional Lutheranism study. Um, every time I've talked with my Lutheran friends, it's only taken about two minutes and 30 seconds to get to mystery. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I've, I've just read too much uh, about how modern Lutheran theology has developed uh, Melanchthon and the changes in Luther after 1525 and all the rest of that kind of fun stuff. I, I love my Lutheran brothers, but um, I, I just don't know how it is overly defensible when it gets into debate, when every in every single Lutheran reform debate, it does take about two minutes and 30 seconds before it's like, well, it's just mystery. And, and you, you, you reform people. You just want to answer too many of the questions that are actually mysteries. Like, no, we're, we're, it's, it's direct biblical revelation. What are you talking about here? So uh, I think Melanchthon, uh, Melanchthon puts you all on roller skates. And so um, it's really hard to stand firm when you're on roller skates. True. No, true that, true that. As a pathologist from Dr. Bob, as a pathologist doing an autopsy will change one's perspective on life, death, and eternity. Love Dr. White's work. A little off topic, but wanted his opinion on the revisionist school of Islam. Wow. Uh, I'm not sure what he means by, by the revisionist school of Islam. I mean, there are obviously Westerners who are in the West, not in, not in Saudi Arabia or Egypt, but in the West, seeking to present sort of a more acceptable version of Islam and Muhammad. Maybe that's what he's referring to. I don't, I don't know. But, in, but if it doesn't have a root and expression in Egypt and Saudi Arabia and maybe Pakistan, it's not going to have much of an impact. Well, in Indonesia, I suppose. Uh, it's not going to have much of an impact upon Islam as a whole. But it's interesting because the first part of the sentence I was department fellow in anatomy and physiology, and we had cadavers at Grand Canyon University. They're chemically preserved, not cold preserved, but phenol we used back then, which I guess since then has been proven to cause cancer. Somehow I've survived. But um, I would give, I would display the the cadavers to high school students. So I was department fellow. So I would, you know, pull the sheet back, do the Quincy thing. You probably don't know what Quincy is, but there was a television program in the United States. I can guarantee you if he's a pathologist, he's seen Quincy, uh, where, where Quincy would pull the sheet back and these cops are passing out and fainting and stuff like that. And, and uh, so I got to do all that stuff. And it's true. When, when you actually display a body, uh, our male body, this guy had smoked his entire life. And anywhere you cut in his lungs was black as pitch. Mm. And you can literally point to the place on his heart that got him. You know that that killed him, um, but it was it 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 truly um, it it made for great illustrations because they were named they're named Willie and Clara those were their real names, and it made great for illustrations for man's deadness and sin mm. because I could do anything I wanted to those two and they never objected because they were dead. Um, mm. So there were lots of interesting applications that you could make from there. Definitely. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Now we have uh, this one from Father James, barely a Protestant. The interesting story behind his name there. Um, but he's an awesome guy, Anglican priest in the United States. Hey, Dr. White, thanks to your work. I left King James onlyism and became Anglican instead of Roman. Seriously, thank you for your work. Question, any advice and wisdom on preaching on things that touch politically hot topics, gay marriage, quote unquote, fa me fa yeah, male, female, etc.? Um, it's real simple. If you are going to, if you're going to be a preacher, that means you are an under shepherd of Christ. And that means your most important task is to speak God's truth to God's people. We are in a situation where God's truth is under direct attack. Um, and mm. our people need to know what God's word says about these things. A movie was just released here in the United States called 1946. Oh, I can't wait to react to that. <laughs> uh, it is a, it's a absurd revisionist uh, attempt to say that arsenicoites does not mean what arsenicoites means. 
Um, I've known about this movie for years. I preached an entire sermon at Apologia Church, linked to it last week, I think, on The Dividing Line, um, on that very subject, because especially at Apologia Church, we want to take advantage of these things. We want to use these as opportunities to present the gospel. And so um, these days, when we're talking about direct gospel issues, Matthew chapter 19, I mean, it's, it's right there. From the beginning, mm. he made the male and female. Mm. This is the authority of Christ. This is our creator speaking. Mm. Um, if we will not speak because of a fear of politics at that point, we shouldn't be preaching at all. Mm. Yeah, I I'm just going to be that straight up front about it. Yeah, totally and true. If people are going to be offended by it, let them be offended by it um, mm. because <clears throat> we don't have any choices at that point. Yeah. Now, Dr. White, I don't think I understand. You see that statement in Matthew, that's not actually the words of Christ. That's that was the uh that was the communications of the Matthean community the as Matthean they developed. Yes, oh yeah, yes, the, the Matthean community that believe me, you're gonna community. find the thing that the thing that is ironic here is you're gonna find yeah. that kind of perspective by people who are part of the papal biblical commission. Um, oh yeah. So oh, yeah. every time my Roman Catholic friends say, Well, you even you can't prove that Matthew wrote Matthew. Your Pope can't figure out if Matthew wrote Matthew either. What are you doing talking to me? <laughs> Dude, don't Google the United States Catholic Bishops Conference or exactly. con con Conference yeah. of Catholic Bishops. Don't look up their Bible commentary. Don't don't look it up, guys. Yeah, guys. Yeah. <laughs> All right. One more from Jay Athanasius as well. Let me Jay Athanasius? That. Yeah, it's, I don't know. It's first name J dot and then Athanasius. I think it's a username or something. But he's a good guy. Very good guy non monogist which is absolutely cringe so i hope he converts <laughs> after after this stream but uh he asks also for dr white how long do you think there has been historically since an eastern church professed monogism as you understand it augustine and aquinas in the west who in the east most recently did the entire east go apostate early in your estimation well see i don't i wouldn't i don't want to use the term apostate that that um, that's mm. not even that's not even the issue um the <laughs> Look, th this take way too long to get into, but um, Eastern theology is um, bounded by the traditional understandings that existed in the sixth and seventh centuries that had already been influenced at that point by numerous um, battles that had taken place. I mean, everybody knows that uh, some of the most important battles took place in the East first in regards to modalism, patripassionism, even before the Aryan controversy in the West and stuff like that. And without getting into all the stuff that deals with Chalcedon and monophysitism and all the rest of that stuff, mm -hmm. one of the problems with Eastern Orthodoxy and one of the reasons that I can't you know, be there is their rejection of sola scriptura leads them leaves them with a frozen in time perspective of tradition and what you need to what i'm what i mean by that mm. is tradition they, they pride be, themselves on that but <laughs> i'm sorry they pride themselves on being frozen in i know time, that but... <laughs> i know that but the problem is the tradition of any one century or a couple of centuries is going to have particular areas of focus. And there's going to be other areas that just simply were not a part of the focus at that time. Mm. And so the, the East needs to work through much of what the West worked through in the Reformation that they've never actually been forced to do so. I mean, think about it. The, what's the first full length treatise on the atonement in church history? It's Athanasius, yeah. ironically. And how many centuries after the time of Christ is that? So there have been issues that have been dealt with, this being one of them, that are after or outside of the boundaries of the tradition walls that have orthodoxy trapped within, within it. Mm. And I'm just thankful that years and years and years ago, I think it was, I think it was even on 
the old Fidonet, and you're too young to know what Fidonet was, but I have no idea what that is. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was before internet, but it was computer communication before internet. Um we had the open Bible echo and the Mormon echo. And man, that was, that was where I cut my teeth long, long, long ago. You'd write somebody a note. Other, everybody else would get to read it, but you wouldn't see the responses for like days. Um, it was a fascinating system. Anyway, uh, I had the opportunity of having some good communication with um, an Eastern Orthodox guy who understood reformed theology. And he was so extremely helpful to me and I hope I was helpful to him as well in coming to understand weaknesses and strengths in that area. And, you know, he was a guy that I think really appreciated what the issues were regarding things like monergism and grace. And as he, as an Orthodox guy could see beyond the walls. Mm. Um, and that's what Orthodoxy needs is to get beyond those walls. But yeah. orthodoxy has defined, has decided that those walls defined them. Yeah. Uh, this this announcement, just what today or yesterday, that the uh, Constantinople is yeah. in talks with Rome about a a similar the, the same day of celebrating Easter. Fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to see some more, you know, hits on the wall, because mm -hmm. um, there's just stuff that's not in that wall of tradition that needs to be dealt with. And that's one of the areas is in yeah. answer to that uh, the issue, the issue yeah. of monergism. Right? Cause I just don't think that that was something that, that they were really dealing with. So 100%. did you say that was last one? Because I'm looking at the clock and unfortunately I I'm, I'm going to be running out of time here. I apologize. How, how long can you stretch it max? Uh, maybe five more minutes. Maybe five more minutes. Okay, I think we can do that. Uh, question, Dr. White, should we consider mere Christian Christians Protestant? Huh. Well, I'm not... I'd say no. But, yeah. I'm not uh, I'm not real big on the term Protestant for the simple reason I know it's historical background and, and yep. always misused. Okay, it had a very technical meaning. Um, uh, the diet, you know, diet of worms, minority... Uh, objection to Charles suppressing the freedom that made them protesters and all the rest of that stuff. Um, if, if the mere Christian label here is what I've talked about where Trinity deity of Christ resurrection, that's all we've got. That's all we can agree on. Gospel is outside. Then the answer would be no. Uh, I would, yeah. I would really struggle with that um, because a gospelless anything isn't Protestant or isn't biblical or isn't really worth having, to be honest with you. Yep, 100%. And one more. I'm going to get it from my friend. This is a free question, but he wanted me to ask this question because, and I think he just only just joined the live chat now. Um, but he asked to me, um, so it was probably be our last one, but. I was wondering, I think he meant that, I was wondering how academics slash apologists, et cetera, argue around the anticipated objections of Romans 9. Um, so I think uh, I think this regards, I think this regards, well, the topic really of, uh, of election, like when Paul says, why does he find sin for who can resist his will? And how, like, we, he, he, he's talked with this, this guy's talked with this uh, to me quite a bit. And it's true how we as monogists will get that objection all the time. Like, how can God find us guilty if he's determined all things, which is functionally Paul, the objection Paul's giving here. Right. And so that's a good sign that we're on the right track with Paul, but non-monogists, as far as I'm aware, virtually never get that objection. So um, I think so. I think he's asking if you know of how non-monogists kind of respond to that argument. Oh, I do. I mean, I, I mean, um, uh, I, I did an entire debate with Leighton Flowers on the subject, so um which is somewhat frustrating to listen to because I'm the only one that actually dealt with Romans nine in that debate. But, True. um, and then I, I did, I did something else with a, another guy who's sort of a provisionist type guy on the unbelievable radio broadcast, um, a, a few years later that I didn't find overly useful, but you, you can look that up. Um, certainly, you know, their ways around this are very, very, very well known, but the, 
the thing that I would emphasize, aside from the fact that the other side doesn't get these objections, is that I think Paul really did answer the objection. There's sometimes mm -hmm. people on our side will say, well, God, you know, Paul didn't really answer the objection because there really isn't an answer. No, I think he did. When mm -hmm. he said, who are you, oh man, mm -hmm. to answer back to God? Yeah. Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? That is the answer. Mm -hmm. It is an ontological answer. It contains within it, you are a man, you are the thing formed, and you are answering back to your potter, to your creator, mm. to your maker. That is the answer. And uh, it is the ontological recognition of the freedom of the creator to do with his creation as he sees fit. Mm. Now, is that objectionable to the natural man? <laughs> That's the whole point of the objection. Yeah, it is. Um, does that not demonstrate that we must have the spirit of God to open hearts and minds to acceptance of, of that truth? Most definitely. That's, yep. that's, that's the case. Yes, definitely. All right. For so many comments, even a couple of uh, super chat. I can, I can look at this one. I have to head out. I'm prepping for an infant baptism this Sunday. You have to throw that in there. Father James. <laughs> Father James. Yeah. Father James. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was Father James. Okay, all right. No, yeah. you're talking, calling me Father James. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't want me to do the dividing line about you, do you? Woo, lad. Uh, come Woo, on, lad. Please do not. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I guess you're pressed for time. So, Dr. White, thank you so much for coming on. This was truly epic, and I really hope it's been helpful to whoever's been watching right now. Um, do you want to make any last-minute plugs for stuff you got happening? or? Nope um uh everyone yeah. knows who i am <laughs> I, yeah watch the dividing line enjoy that's, that's true, the best true that <laughs> still need to catch your latest sweater vest dialogue that's going to be cool yes um, yes but yes 100 percent, doc thank you so much for coming on super sorry i couldn't catch like even half the questions out there even even a couple of super chats haven't haven't been able to get you unfortunately i'll say this guy as a kansas boy myself what up dr what <laughs> Oh, as a Kansas boy. Well, my dad was born in Kansas. I wasn't born in Kansas. But, uh, <laughs> Close enough. Yeah. Close enough. Anyway, <laughs> Doc, thank you so much for coming on. This, everybody watching, this has been The Other Paul. This has been Dr. James White. I hope you all have a lovely day or evening. God bless. See you next time.